it's the mountain environment. It's somewhere that I work a lot, uh, and hopefully um, there'll be there'll be we're looking at some of the habitats, but also a couple of ideas um, and interactive kind of activities to do along the way. But it won't all be interactive activities as such. But so through this presentation, hoping to develop observational skills, increase knowledge of mountain habitats and to use the natural world to wow your clients. So it's really just thinking of ways that we can uh, engage them and maybe facilitate their, their kind of learning and that journey. So something just to start off, um, I'd, like you, I'd like to do something with you called a thinking routine. Uh, putting yourself in the picture, uh, I do this quite a lot. It's a, an activity I do when I go to a new environment with people uh, just have a look at uh, kind of what people's thoughts and, and, and ideas are. So if we run through this, and I do it quite a lot with, I'm starting to anyway, I've been doing it for about the last year. Um, and it's a visible thinking routine. Um, so what I'd like you to do now is just, you can either jot it down or, or just um, have a thought. But what do you see when you see that picture? So if you're there right now, what do you see? And obviously, if we're all together, people would be saying there'd be blue skies, there'd be mountains, there'd be colours, clouds, ridges, rocks, mountains. Then, what do you think? When you look at that environment, what do you think? And I, I can't interact with you right now, but you may think, oh, it's summertime, or I think it's wild, I think it's beautiful. I think it's quite a cool place to go. It'd be lovely to go camping now. I think it'd be a fantastic place to, to, to take a group. Now, what do you wonder? What do you wonder about that environment or that picture? So you may wonder, how high is that mountain? Where are we in the world? Um, will I get wet feet if I walk across that low area there? I wonder how old the rocks are. But the whole point of that exercise, the see, think, wonder, is just to look at, um, it's like a little routine that you just do to just put ourselves in the picture. Um, and I just find it a really useful um, way of kind of setting a scene with the group. Another activity I use regularly um, are, is an activity called stimulus cards. So I'd hand out a card to each person that I've got and on those cards there's a, a little statement or a comment or something and then for the next few minutes we would think about what's on that so it's again it's another routine um, and it's to create an observational approach putting ourselves in the picture and really it's for me to find out what people's thoughts and knowledge and opinions are so have a go there's three of them here so how will this view look in a hundred years So again, just letting people make their own thoughts and their own observations and their own mind. Next one. If you could introduce any animals into this landscape, what would they be? So again, in terms of maybe conservation, people would have various, you know, interests or knowledge on certain topics of rewilding, for instance, or, um, and then the third one, what clues can you see in the landscape that may tell you what rock type you're on? Okay, so just again, it's setting the scene, it's starting to get people to make observations about the natural world. Um, and that's really the style that I like to kind of facilitate my, my workshops. So instead of me talking all the time, I like people to engage and, and interact. And maybe these are activities that you could think, ah, oh, in the work that I do, I would take this and I would do that with those students or I would do that with these, this, this kind of client group. So, you know, take these ideas for what they are, think how you can apply them to what you do as well. So, um, we're going to look now, no more activities for a bit, we're just going to look at some of the different habitats in the mountain environment. So when we look at the mountain environment, 
broadly speaking, we know them as our uplands and the mountains, the moorlands, uh, kind of the area of land which is above the limit of agricultural enclosure. It's accepted to be around the 600 meter contour and above. So they're remote, the wild places. And up there, the relief is the high areas. They're in the west and the north of Britain. They're associated, the next photo shows kind of a rainfall um, map of the UK. So our uplands are, are cold. There's increased humidity, increased rainfall, uh, more frosts and winds are also important. So they're, they're significant environments um, that are above the lowlands and the remote wild kind of windswept um, expanses. Um, within that, we're gonna look at six broad habitats that we find within our mountain environment. So we've got the mountain tops themselves, we've got heather moorlands, which we probably, we work in equally, maybe around moorlands and uh, on the mountains. We walk through woodlands, we've got grasslands, mires and bogs. And we've got forestry. So I'm going to run through these and then we're going to have an interactive quiz. So on the mountains, we've got three broad categories of, of environment. So we've got dwarf shrub communities. Shrubs are basically woody plants and they're stunted. Um, they're long lived and they can dominate over a, a long period of time. So in that photo there um, is uh, an upland plant called a least willow. And um, what you see above ground are the leaves, all the branches and the twigs and the roots, they're all underground. So that area in that photo there, maybe a couple of square meters, is possibly just one plant that's grown underground and shot under the, under the roots, uh, under the stones. But then the leaves appear above ground. So really it's a perfectly adapted to live in this very um, hostile environment, really. Um, we also get other, Plants in Scotland, you get trailing azalea. Again, it's a woody shrub, long lived. They lived to about 110 years old. Um, so they're very long lived dwarf plants that have uh, waxy leaves. So on. Another group of plants that are really common in the mountain are cryptogams. And the cryptogams are the spore bearing plants. So they cover the ferns, the mosses, and the lichens. They're well adapted to long periods of snow cover. And the word cryptogam actually means hidden reproduction. They're very resistant to uh, drought and they live on the bare rock and, and in small little crevices, but it's a very dry environment, even though there's high rainfall. So they're, they're very well adapted to, to long periods without water. Um, and the lichens, so the crusty crustos lichens actually um, break down, they just go into the surface of, of the rock and they eventually break up the rock and release minerals. And as they die, and uh, they, they form a very thin organic layer with the mineral soil, and they, they develop um, what are the, the very tiny fragments of, of um, or the beginnings of a, of a soil that you find up high in the mountains. Another really important aspect of our mountain tops are the rock ledge communities. These are um, areas where we find a lot of our rarer Arctic alpine species that are away from the grazing animals and are uh, able to survive just in the crevices. So they're kind of hostile environments, but they're, um, they make use of, of maybe rich um, bases and, and seepage that comes through the rocks. And so they're, they can be quite luxuriant little ledges. Um, and in that photo, we've got rose root, which is a, a more of an Arctic species, but you do find it in the Alps. And then you also get moss campion so it's a cushion forming plant um, so these are long-lived organisms or plants that live in these rock ledge communities which are um, kind of relics from our old ice age um, but they're but they're really happy in these in these damper cooler um, environments up high in the mountains but they're very poorly um, they're very poor competitors, so you really rarely find them on grasslands and in moorlands. So if we look at moorlands, moorlands dominated by heather are usually found the above the agriculture, uh, above cultivated agriculture, so above 300 metre elevation, uh, and they're open hillsides. 
there's less field boundaries and so on. They have this wild feel about them. Um, you occasionally get trees, but the trees are, are kept down by all the grazing animals. The origins of moorlands, all moorlands, essentially all moorlands were once forested, but the deforestation began soon as people started settling during the Neolithic time, 5,000 years ago. And they cut down the trees, they created agriculture, and um, they brought in domesticated animals. So that deforestation process began over many thousands of years. But the uplands were never as cultivated as the lowlands, which were richer and, and warmer and a better environment. But still, our moorlands are managed and they're, they're sporadically burnt. For, so for sheep grazing, they're, they're haphazardly burnt. Um, naturally, every few hundred years, you might get a lightning strike, which, which creates this environment. So they do burn naturally, but um, they're burnt on an annual basis on a kind of haphazard way for, for sheep grazing. Um, and the fire produces a surge of seedlings. Uh, it's a traditional tool for managing moorlands. It removes dead um, vegetation, it encourages this growth and food, and uh, it adds minerals and potassium things back into the soil. So it makes the soil a much more fertile place. So there you got a photo of regeneration of a, a rowan tree. If you look at grouse moorlands, they're managed in a very, very organized way in sort of strips of land. It's very important to have uh, low cut areas for grouse, but then also mature or taller areas where the heathers are, if they're allowed to grow to maybe their full age is 40 years old. When they're that age, they're very woody, but very tall, they're about a meter tall. And that provides nesting and, and an environment for protection for the grouse. Um, but the young shoots, and mainly the ling heather, um, when they're under five to 10 years old, you get much better food production from those. So um, there's this management, and it's about 8% of an area which is burned on a rotation to keep the heather young, to maintain that, that kind of environment for the young tender shoots for the grouse. If you look at woodlands, we've got wildwoods. Wildwoods were once really dominant in our uplands, up to a, a natural tree line of about 600 metres. This photo is from Wisman's Wood, which is a, an old sessile oak woodland down in Dartmoor. It's a very small remnant now of what was once uh, would have covered our uplands. Um, there would be a mix of rowan trees, um, birch, willow, hazel, and obviously the, the sessile oak there. Up in Scotland, the story is very different, where the climate's cooler and Scots pine um, survived and, and provided the, the kind of natural vegetation. Their tree line was naturally about 550 meters. Um, but shortly after the ice age, um, the, uh, that pine forest dominated Britain. But then from about 7,000 years ago, the climate improved and warmed up and you can see in that image there, that's the extent of the natural wild Caledonian forest from the southern highlands. Um, below that would have been deciduous forest, but you can see the little black dots in that image and they're what are left of that once massive expanse of, of wild wood up in, uh, in Scotland. So we have ancient woodlands and an ancient woodland is a woodland which has been around for at least 400 years since the first maps were drawn up and we knew what land was where and, and land uses and, and so on, the old tithing maps. Um, and they're relatively undisturbed. We've got indicators of ancient woodlands from our wildflowers, but we also have indicators from lichens and uh, on the trees. And these are really important along with all the, the bryophytes and the mosses that indicate that these this woodland environment has existed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. But woodlands are managed, and for thousands of years they've been managed. Coppices, like this hazel coppice, um, date back thousands of years. And uh, we needed forests for resource for timber and for wood products. And so for three thousands of years since the Iron Age really introduced um, 
coppicing for charcoal. Um, coppicing has also been used for uh, more lately in the tanning industry. So uh, you'd have a coppice of oak trees for um, for the, the bark which contained tannic acid and that was used in the, the leather tanning industry. So woodlands have, have got variety of management techniques. They've also got um, historical woodland pastures so the young shoots are, are eaten but you live but we we have this variety of woodland environments where um, we allow grazing and you get a grassland underneath but other areas of woodland were um, you know the wild animals would have would have lived more in a coppiced environment or maybe even in a pollarded environment like the lower photo where the grazing animals wouldn't the, the coppice essentially is done above the height of the, the grazing animals so that um, you could then harvest that crop for winter feed but without them eating it during the year. So you've got different techniques for management and it goes back thousands of years. Other habitats we've got, we've got rough grazing. Um, grasslands do occur naturally but really they were extensive areas um, within the woodland kind of glade environment but then through the deforestation we've we've got greater expanses of, of grasslands unimproved grassland like we've got there is known as rough grazing then we've got improved grasslands where they're fertilized and seed flower um grass species have been seeded and it's increased and improved grasslands but traditionally grasslands were not improved and we had a lot of hay meadows and they were really important for harvesting unimproved grasslands, uh, these rich hay meadows. But then subsequently in the last 50 years or, or more, the hay meadow population or density is reduced because of silage production and the increased fertility and the added nutrients. So um, we get more silage now, but we get a lot less of these flower rich hay meadows. But they're all grass on habitats, we still do have these. In terms of wetlands, we've got uh, mires. Now, mires, um, if they're acidic, we know them as bogs. Uh, if they're alkali, we know them as fen. So that's a, one of the broad distinctions between them. But for what's in common with all mires is they have a, a peaty soil and that peat formation uh, occurs under three conditions. So it's gotta be cold, it's gotta be acidic conditions, so bacteria and fungi can't, can't function, and also the absence of oxygen. So the amount of decomposition decreases and the peat accumulates. Um, peat accumulates at a rate, in a hundred years, the peat will accumulate two to three centimeters depth. So it's a very, very slow, um, development of a peaty um, soil. So two, three centimetres in hundred years. So in 10 years, it's two cent, uh, yeah. So it's an uh, incredibly slow process. But you need high rainfall and you need one specific uh, moss, which is a sphagnum moss, which is really, really dominant. And it's essential in the formation of peat. And there's 37 species of, of sphagnum in the UK about 250 worldwide, but those are critical in the formation of peat. In terms of bogs, we have raised bogs, which are small areas where it's a waterlogged environment, or we have blanket bogs where we have very high rainfall areas and they cover our uplands. And basically in the uplands, we get blanket bogs because we get cold weather, high rainfall, and there's about 160 days or more of rain and about a metre and a half of, of rain in that year. So you get blanket bogs when there's high, high rainfall. A raised bog is something that you get when there's a depression. And they're called rays because the sphagnum lives just above the water level. So it just lives above that, the water table, absorbs water they're like little sponges and they take about 20 times their weight in or their capacity in water. So they're incredible sponges, but they live just above the bog so you get this raised effect and there's different species that like different conditions. Lastly we just look at a bit of forestry so forestry began at the end of the 18th century European species like silver fir and Norway spruce but then during 
The 19th century had more exotic species and Sitka spruce came in and Douglas fir and Japanese larch and so on. So those species came in. And then there was had a massive impetus for large scale afforestation at the at end of the First World War. And we saw the establishment of what we now know as the Forestry Commission in 1919. And there was a massive reduction in the amount of forest in Britain because of the resources needed during the war and building props for pits and all sorts of things. Um, so they created and afforested large areas. Um, forestry does have its conservation issues. You've got clear felling that still goes on and there's conservation areas of, of, of forestry as well. It's also on land which is it is old moorland generally, which was once woodland, so it's afforested an old ancient woodland site. Um, but it's affected the number of the biodiversity is affected by these monoculture plantations. So the ground nesting birds and things uh, like Dunlin and, and golden plover. But then you get more siskins and crossbills. So there are some benefits of them, but there's also a great amenity value with them as well. So that's the end of the habitat. Now we're going to go to a quiz. One more of those uh, coming up after we look at, um, we're going to look at six different species that you're going to come across in the mountains, in the, in the bogs and, and, and as you go walking in the mountain environment. Um, the photo comes up first, so I don't know if you know what that one is. Um, just coming into flower as we speak. Um, very small plant, um, common milkwort. Um, lives on dry heaths. There's also another variety, pretty much identical to it, that lives in wet heath. Um, small difference between the two. But um, milkwort. What What's interesting about milkwort is the the uh, I always find it in the name. So the Latin name Polygala vulgaris. Polygala means lots of milk. Vulgaris is means common. But vulga, um, polygala comes from the the Greek meaning much milk, and the plant had a reputation for increasing milk flow in cattle. I think the hooks that we, we learn about flowers, or we learn about anything, is the, the thing that really, um, is the thing that we remember more about the plant, and it's an interesting story. It's often the hook that we use when we're engaging our groups. This flower is, uh, comes out in July in wet areas. It's, um, beautiful it's it's reddish kind of stamens were used as saffron or instead of saffron in, in coloring flavoring foods um bog aspidal um i don't know you'll see it in from july flowering in, in the wet bogs ossiflagum it's so it's latin name again it's a latin origin um ossi or from ossia from osteo from from bones and fragum from fragile so it it was thought to to give cows and and cattle um, brittle bones but really it's the fact that the environment that these plants are growing in that the cattle were grazing in is a very nutrient poor environment so they weren't really getting the nutrition so it's a bit unfair on the plant waxy leaves a small little woody shrub that you'll find in the upland so really in uh in the uk it's an upland heath species so it appears from about five or six hundred meters in elevation so it's a good altitude um, indicator i'm sure in some place it grows at lower levels your red berries uh cow berry um, it's a long-lived plant but the shoots themselves only live for a short amount of time so it's they like make clones of these mat forming shrubs make clones of themselves and as they grow the younger shoots survive but the old um and then um, so the young shoots don't live for long, but the rootstock remains for quite a while and, and so they, they grow. So um, again, I think some of the ages of these, about 140 years, I think they are known to grow. So they're very, very long lived species. Um, a wetland heath species, the cluster of bells at the top um, is the giveaway for this and it's in a wetland environment and it's cross leaved heath. It's got sticky glands or the hairs on the on the stems are sticky and it Charles Darwin suspected that that could be a, a form of carnivory. Never shown to to be that 
but uh, but it was good observation that he made. A very distinctive plant, again, of bogs, low environment, low nutrient environment. The making use of of not the nutrients from the peat, which all that energy is locked up in, and the organ organic matter, but being an insectivorous plant, you can see the 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 leaves like green tongues are sticky and they exude this enzyme which attracts the insects and then digests them over about 24 hour period so butterwort um that's the main species that we, we see over here in the uk um but yeah they won't be coming to flower yet but the leaves in welsh it's tabod gorse which means the tongue of the bog so i think it represents those leaves really well finally it is a grass that um, when it's not trodden on, looks like that, <laughs> when it's trodden on in the, in the wet moorlands, so it likes wet condition, it looks like that and it looks like it's been, um, the, the grass blades pu get pushed out to the side but it becomes bald on top. Um, so it doesn't like being trampled but it tolerates it and um, it's called deer grass but the name comes from the colour that it goes in the autumn, so it turns its lovely fawn brown colour in the autumn. We're going to do one more. How do you wow your clients? This is the, this is the, the kind of fun, the activities, and, and, and this is the, the thing that I really enjoy on my workshops that when I give them, is I end up facilitating more than teaching. There is elements of teaching, sharing knowledge, but Really, I'm interested in how in the process of learning and I like people to be engaged so that when the leaders leave the workshop, they'll feel empowered to actually use some of these activities or, or uh, you know, have more confidence in the way they, they deliver their, their own um, kind of, uh, you know, on their own learning journey. So how do you wow people? We engage with stories. We've learned some stories about flowers just in the previous section. We get involved with activities. And I like the, the, the route of inquiry, um, the questioning. Why is this? What's that? Make that observation and so on. So one activity that I do uh, a lot is something called give us a clue. And it's, if I, um, it basically reveals uh, a tree slowly and uh, I'll explain it as we go through it but basically I'll start that process of learning and we're going to run through one of these examples. Some of you will know from the very first clue what this tree is, some of you won't but come through the end of the, the process you'll hopefully have learned a lot and have got better observation. So let's just run through this. Some of you may know from this vague clues the bark's often carved by people. So if you're in a park, you often see engraved names on this, this tree. The leaves were chewed instead of tobacco during World War II. And actually they've just come into leaf at the moment. They're young and fresh and they're really beautiful and edible leaves. The peeled and roasted nuts have been used as a substitute for coffee. So there's some things that are maybe getting your thoughts going, what you might think it could be. Here are some more clues, might lead you towards it a little bit more easily. So the oil from the seed um, is used in cooking. The female flowers develop a bristly brown husk. And its shallow roots are often not rooted in severe storms. So if you, were, if you were in a forest and you were thinking about camping, you certainly wouldn't camp underneath this tree because the tree's limbs are known to, to just fall off as well. So there's another clue. Photo of the twig, and there's a bud in there as well, long pointy bud. There's a photo of the bark with the inscription, smooth bark. And then the last thing I would show is the photo of the, of the, the leaf, because it's the thing with the tree that is the most obvious. So some of you hopefully will know it by now. If you don't know it now, looking at that, well, if you had that in your hand, or if you had the card in your hand, that tree, I would play the game where that, that tree is near you. So your job would then be to take those cards and to go to that tree and find that tree from where you are. I'll put the scientific name in there, but I don't put the, the common name 
because if you go to the back you see the common name you go oh look it's the beech tree then you'd go straight to the tree go i know what a beech tree is and you haven't gone on that process of learning so the idea is it unravels as it goes along um on another botanical theme i've got a botanical theme that runs through everything i do really and through my teaching um i find them the most reliable source of of kind of um uh, for, to facilitate learning and i can use lots of samples you know they're there throughout the year if i'm bird watching and it's cloudy or windy you don't get to see any birds so the, the trees and the flowers are so so important i think um because they're, they're always there so i use them a lot in my teaching say in the winter you, you see that tree and you think oh i haven't a clue what that is much easier if you had a leaf in your hand or if you saw it in the summer it might take you a closer look and you can see there's a twig with a cluster of buds. You might not have noticed those before because it's winter and, and uh, it's, all very, it's all very barren. Um, this time of year, you'll start to see the, the, the pollen and the male flowers forming these long uh, uh, structures and the leaves just coming in at the moment as well. So this time of year, you might, you might notice things that you wouldn't necessarily notice um in this picture so if i was to show you that picture you go oh i know what that is it's an oak tree um because the leaf is the obvious feature that that we generally recognize trees by but that's an oak leaf as well and would you say they're from the same tree uh this leaf, for instance, got one, two, three, four, five lobes. This one has got one, two, three lobes on that side. This, if you can follow the cursor, you've got a long stalk here on this, and this has a very short stalk, and actually the leaf comes down, makes a lobe at the bottom as well. So subtle differences. They're actually different species. The oak on the left produces an acorn with um with no stalk and the oak on the right produces an acorn on the stalk so there are different species and i don't know if you've guessed but the one with the acorn without a stalk is sessile oak and sessile means stalkless or, or non-moving and the other one is the english or the common oak so there are subtle differences even when you see an oak tree, an oak leaf, they're a different species. So it's the finer detail. Um, and another activity that I do, I'm gonna show you some twigs. What I like to do, it's not so easy to be uh, interactive here, but what I like to do is pick one of those twigs. You may know what they are, you may not know what it is, but just if you can look at one and just make an observation about one of those twigs so pretend you have one in your hand make an observation now icebreaker activity you could ask the students who you've got with you to go and find the tree from what you've got in your hand so can they locate the tree by making those observations if you had two of each of those then you could get them to pair up so just as an idea, you get them to make observations, then they could pair up. You might get them to find someone who's got a different twig and talk about similarities or differences. What's common, what's not common with them? What features can you see? What can't you see? So on. So you can develop um, even bringing English in and, and uh, cross-curricular things with this. You can bring science into it and you can use it to classify. Now, I would do this with a group of teachers, but because we're all virtual and at home, what I'd like you to do is imagine you're, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions and, you're, and they're all, um, we can classify what we've got. Um, so I'd like you to raise your hand or virtually raise your hand if the twig that you've picked has what I'm going to mention now. So, um, stick your hand up virtually or real, if your plant uh, twig has buds. Okay, now, um, if, see your hand up, if 
uh, your twig is has got smooth bark, if you can tell. Would you say it looks smooth or rough? Another one you might say, well, sit your hand up if you can see catkins. So they're the flowers that are forming. I can see them on two of those samples there. Another one you might think, sit your hand up if the buds come off in pairs on the twig. Some of them are in pairs, some of them look like they're alternate. Another one, stick your hand up if it's got pointy buds. Stick your hand up if it's got thorns, so on and so forth. So it's really developing observational skills, but we're learning to classify. And if you had a group of key stage three and, you, and you're looking at classification, that would be a perfect example of, of an activity that you could bring in outdoor learning into, um, into your, your session. So again, um, last, of the, the pictures of, of these different activities. These are out at the moment. I took that photo the other day. It's a beautiful bluebell. Or is it a beautiful bluebell? They're both beautiful, but is it the bluebell that we know is a native bluebell? Well, that one's actually a Spanish bluebell. And then we've got the one which is native. So the Spanish bluebell was introduced, obviously, from Spain. And how would you know the difference between them? Well, the scent. The, the scent of the Spanish bluebell, it doesn't have a scent at all. But if you smell the native bluebell, it's got a beautiful, sweet scent. So that's one of the differences. The colour. These are very dark violet, the native bluebell. With these, they've got, you can see the, the dark blue lines, but they're much paler. Paler blue. The flower shape. So these are bells which open out and they, they curl out at the bottom. So they, they kind of um, open out from, from, from where they're, they're born at the top there. Whereas the native bluebell has got these long parallel sides and then they curl up right at the very end. And then the leaves are different. So there are, even though you might look at a bluebell, if we maybe look at them now in a slightly different light, and, oh, well, actually, is it this or is it that? Is it a hybrid? So say you had some resources. Say you had um, some cards and on those cards were uh, different species. Those species on different suits could be in different habitats. So Ramsons uh, is a woodland plant. Jamanda Speedwell is a heathland plant. So you've got different habitats. So you had trump cards and you've got uh, a whole series of, of, of plants with different characteristics, so plant height, rarity, and, and scent. They've all got fab facts on them. What game or activity could you play if you had a set of cards with you? I ran a competition a week ago and had some fantastic responses, and some of the things that came back were really novel, and these are put on a worksheet, which you can just download from our website, uh, which I'll give you a link in a minute. You can stick it on your head and it's guess who I am. Everyone else knows. You can ask yes or no uh, question or answers can only be yes or no. Is my plant yellow? Is it got five petals? It's a brilliant, simple game. You might do matching pairs. So it'd be good if you had two sets of cards, but you could put different cards down, a bit of a memory game, but using the cards to learn about the different flowers. You play snap. You can play snap with habitat, you could play snap with colour, snap with number of petals, and so on. So there's all sorts of ways you can adapt activities to play. And you can also use it in a grouping sense. So find someone with, uh, hand out the cards and group all the ones with yellow flowers together, group all the ones. So it's kind of interactive games that you can play with cards. So that's just a series of or ideas um, that you could do if you had a resource, uh, and it's a, a plug -on, on some of the things I've developed, I've got playing cards and trump cards, both Alpine and British. The playing cards are at the factory and sh that shut last week due to the COVID-19. So there's a delay on the delivery of those, but I've got trump cards available uh, and a book. And this presentation will be available on the MTA Facebook page later. So there's a link to my shop um, and then the very last thing I'd like, just feedback, there's a bit like the Kahoot. If you type in on your phone, 
www.menti.com and then there is a code which is 8927779 and uh, that's the code. If you could just answer three simple, um, there's three slides and so if you enter that code then uh, Brilliant, they'll pop up. The first ones will pop up as a word cloud, the second one's a slider, and the third one's just your ideas for what you might want on another uh, workshop. I'll put this word cloud on with the MTA Facebook page with a, a link to the presentation. Hey, great, some lovely words coming through there. Enjoyable, clear, interesting, engaging, which is hopefully um, useful, stimulating, interactive, fun, fantastic. I'll let those words come in. We'll look at um, the ratings for usefulness, the quality of the presentation, if you found it inspiring, and if you enjoyed the quizzes and the activities. And then the third one, um, we'll just start gathering all your thoughts. And I'll have a chat with Joe later. If you'd like something on mammals? That was great, thank you. And thank you very much. Um, mammals, geology, birds, mammals, yeah. That's great. More plants, geology, rivers. Fantastic. I'll share these with, with Joe and we'll work out how we can get all the feedback to you. But um, I can download all the, all the results from this. So hopefully you found the Kahoot interesting. It's an interactive thing that I've only recently come across. And then Mentimeter, which is this way of just doing this interactive feedback. So that's... Um, Human impacts, geology, birds, invertebrates, yeah. Superb, and if I head back to that rating, that's fantastic. And the word cloud, getting bigger and bigger. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much for your participation and uh, involvement there. Um, and yeah, hopefully you found something that you'll be able to take away and use with, you know, uh, in your own line of work, hopefully. So, uh, Joe, I'll leave it over to you.